Good afternoon. I'm Carmen Blair, the Deputy Director of the San Mateo County Historical Association, and I would like to welcome you to this afternoon's courthouse docket. A special welcome to Mitch Postal, President of the San Mateo County Historical Association, and David McLean, Director of Community Relations and Marketing at the College of San Mateo. The Courthouse Docket is a monthly series of lectures and performances held right here in Historic Courtroom A. Each month, we explore a different aspect of local history. Today, a new changing exhibit opens at the History Museum. College of San Mateo, 100 Years of Making Dreams Come Through. As I worked on the exhibit team, it quickly became clear to me that the College Readiness Program was an important part of CSM's story. Our panel today will be exploring the program and its legacy. At this time, I would like to introduce Leila Tamale, a CSM alum who will be moderating today's discussion. She was born and raised in San Mateo on the unceded land of the Muweka Maloney, where she attended the College of San Mateo and earned her associate degrees in ethnic studies, political science, and social sciences. In her time at CSM, Leila had the joy and honor of being a student of the Mana Learning Community, serving as co-president of student-led organizations, the Tasa Pacifica and Bavamale, learning under the Honors Pro Project and working for the Multicultural and Dream Center as a scholar intern. In her role as scholar intern, Layla helped organize CSM's first ever social justice conference, Rise in Revolution, inspired by the legacy of CRP. She recently transferred to Stanford University and is studying comparative studies in race and ethnicity. She intends to continue advocating for uh, marginalized communities and her new institution and beyond. Welcome. This was truly a testament to his initial involvement with CRP. 
Today, he is co-faculty advisor to the Puente Club at CSM, and for the last 12 years, a proud member of the scholarship committee. Jackie Santizo, she, her, is an experienced queer, racial, immigrant justice educator and liberationist. Jackie received a master's degree from the nation's first college of ethnic studies at San Francisco State University. With a deep love for world making and community building, Jackie is skilled at teaching, leadership development, group facilitation, DEI consultation, program development, and project management. Currently, she teaches part time and coordinates the CSM Multicultural and Dream Center, or MCCDC. The MCCDC is a racial justice based student center rooted in the initiatives of the College of San Mateo's College Readiness Program in Mississippi. Okay, so beginning with Edgar's presentation, um, just to give you an opening question um, that you can reflect on and answer throughout your session, what were the historical, social, and political contexts surrounding the birth and development of the College Readiness Program? Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you. Um, I want to start by acknowledging our uh, original caretakers of this land, the Ramitu Shaloni people, here in uh, what is now known as San Mateo County, which has a particularly, particularly interesting history uh, in the whole quote-unquote discovery of the Bay Area and the foundation of the Bay Area. San Mateo County really uh, plays a pivotal role there. And in acknowledging the Ramitu Shaloni people, um, uh, in reminding us and thinking about the ongoing indigenous struggles that indigenous people in the Bay Area continue to, to, um, to bring forth and, and, and present. I also want to acknowledge uh, all of my teachers and my mentors uh, in the field of critical thinking and ethnic studies and developing a love for ethnic studies that I am sure we all share because we're all here to hear about uh, these struggles of the 1960s that, that truly in essence were led because of love, a certain kind of love. And so today what we're gonna hear, both through my short presentation, my short contribution, my humble contribution, and the contribution of my colleagues is precisely how that love manifested and hopefully continues to manifest and will continue to manifest. So acknowledging that the teachers who, who were able to transmit that love to us, that we can now articulate through ideas, through epistemological frameworks, and so on and so forth, that the, that the very root of it is that love that's been transmitted and continues on. I want to acknowledge also yourselves for being here. Thank you for taking the time to share in this love, in this learning, and in this understanding. Uh, your own lived experience. I see a multi-generational uh, uh, audience here, and I want to acknowledge that. that. Many of you might have participated in many of these movements, and so acknowledging that uh, as, 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 as we are here. And I want to especially acknowledge the children who are here, that they may also be uh, 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 transmitted with this love that we're going to talk about, uh, uh, this story. And, and to be honest, I am much more uh, comfortable to be here because the children are here. And that, that whatever I can say, uh, that goes for them. You're all invited to hear in the conversation, but whatever I can say uh, goes for them. So um, I want to do it like that. Can we all do it like that? And, um, and so I want to start by by thinking about the College Readiness Program as a student-led movement here at the College of San Mateo and trying to contextualize that student-led movement within a broader picture of student-led uh, revolutionary movements of the 1960s. Right? That this was happening not only here in the United States, but it was a global sort of social earthquake that was taking place. And student movements, and particularly students. And this is why we continue to, many of you who have grown older maybe realize Students have the energy, so when you see the students popping up with that energy, let's put our support there because as we grow older, that energy tends to, to dwindle a bit. And we've seen those students' movement, movements pop up, as I said, not just in the United States, but we saw them in Mexico, we saw them in Europe, we saw them in France, we saw them in Asia. And it was a particular moment of social crisis, but a particular social crisis that I think enabled a different kind of thinking, imagining a different kind of world, right? On the heels of the civil rights movement here in the United States. And I think it's very telling that student-led movements and power movements emerged on the heels of the civil rights movement because there was a realization that something else needed to happen to our communities beyond, which is a very important aspect of, of, of envisioning equality, but something else needed to happen beyond 
uh, establishing laws uh, for equality at the constitutional level. Right? That students had a particular concern with the kind of vision and the kind of role they wanted uh, for themselves and, and for their communities. And so what we see is a preoccupation then of creating fields of study. It wasn't just about entering the, the university. It wasn't just about entering academic spaces. That was not enough because they understood a particular history of, of a very hegemonic way of, of knowledge production that distorted or invisibilized, right? at the very best distorted, at the very worst invisibilized, the histories and the relationships of those histories to the making of the world which we all inhabit. So it wasn't enough just to open that door, to demand access to institutions of higher education, but that we also needed to have control and a say in which kind of education we wanted for ourselves and for our communities. Relevant education. Education that could have an impact on our communities. Education that could lead us in, as we, we, we've had this discussion, into this elusive sense of liberation. I mean, we were dreaming big, with big words. <laughs> Bigger than any kind of theoretical or epistemological framework. Of, like, liberation, that's a big word. And what does that mean? And we didn't have it all figured out, obviously. But we dare to dream in that way. We dare to think that another world is possible uh, in that way. And what was particularly interesting about this student-led movement, right? It was very different from any other movements. Very different. It was truly from the community up. It wasn't a top-down kind of uh, uh, a move that the academic spaces were making for people. It was not. We can think of area studies, for example, that would come during the Cold War as government and university academic spaces uh, enable programs in which we get to study these other people and we get to see their economic and social and political uh, uh, structures so that we can better uh, um, uh, mobilize our, 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 strategy, our strategies and our goals. It wasn't like that. This was new. This was a, a very innovative uh, a, a project of enabling uh, or uh, of, of, um, materializing the presence of communities of color at the academic spaces and then bringing that knowledge and those resources back into the communities. And we see examples throughout. Now, what's particular about uh, these movements is that from the beginning, there's a commitment of anti-racism, anti-imperialism, which means that there's an understanding of how these structures of race and racism and imperialism come about. And part of that understanding requires a keen sense of historical awareness. And hence, the emphasis then on trying to learn the history of how these structures emerge and develop. Because if we are going to commit ourselves to an anti-racist, anti-imperial vision of the world, we must have an understanding of how these structures come about. And that's perhaps one of the greatest contributions of ethnic studies, that it continues to ask those questions. The other aspect in, in prioritizing an anti-racist, anti-imperialist approach is that it necessarily forces us to think in coalition. That it necessarily forces us to think beyond borders, nation states, walls, physical and otherwise. That's another of the great contributions of the field. That it, it, it allows us, it enables us to really question this idea of borders and to really open up ourselves through coalition, through shared history and common struggle. Through shared history and common struggle. Another aspect of ethnic studies um, and the field of ethnic studies and the scholarship of ethnic studies, that another manifestation of this love to see a different world is now ethnic studies is forced to engage and think with broader questions beyond just, uh, uh, or incorporating uh, the environmental well-being as, con as uh, intrinsically related to community well-being. To think of ourselves in relationship also to the environment and the ways in which indigenous people have been thinking and struggling in relation to, to the environment as well. Because an impact on the environment is a direct impact into our communities. And so it's opening up all those conversations. It's having all those conversations that enabled and that has enabled our field to remain relevant uh, to this day.
because our society continues to be plagued by questions of race and racism and sexism and homophobia and patriarchy. And even though we imagine a different world to come, uh, well, <laughs> and yet asking the questions, academic and community spaces to ask these questions continues to be as relevant today as it was then. And will continue to be as relevant for our children as it is for us. So that we can continue to keep asking these questions, these important questions, right? Of how do we dis uh, 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 how do we deconstruct these structures, and what does it take to deconstruct these structures? Right? I follow the advice of one of my elders who says who was very actively involved in the 1960s in the social movements, in the anti-war movements, in recognizing our humanity, um, and and says. Keep always in mind that what, what, what we have been fighting for, what has ethnic studies as an academic space, but also as a community space. And I want us always to remember that, that ethnic studies is not only an academic space, it's an, a community space from its inception. And my elder says, what, what, what we have been fighting for has an end being justice, has an end being peace, an end to violence, has an end being the upholding of our humanity and nurturing our humanity. Isn't that what we have been fighting for in whatever space that we can uh, uh, muster, whether in the classroom or within the communities? And my elder says, then always keep in mind that what, that which we have been fighting for, we must fight for it also in our relations. So that if you're fighting for justice, then be just in your relations. And if you're fighting for equality, then be equal and fair in your relations. And if you're fighting for peace, then have peace in your relations. And in that way, as the world continues to turn and turn, in that way, at least we have won already. And that's another aspect of our field. Right? To never forget why it is that we opened up, we fought to open up these spaces. And to never forget also the potential that it has for transformation for, uh, within academic spaces and also in the community. And for our children. Always remember the children, right? Always remember the children, because otherwise why we do what we do? If it's not for our children, right? So in that way, I, I wanted to share those reflections um, about, and as my colleagues will continue to uh, enlighten us on the development of the CFP, the College Readiness Program, as one of those manifestations, as one of those manifestations uh, of love of the field, that these students were inspired through that same love to create that change at this particular space, as it was happening across the bay, across the state, across the nation, across the world. Right? And I'm sure they're going to raise questions about whether, you know, where, where, where that vision and where that love is right now, within our own institutions, within our own communities, or within our own relations. Right? So it's that big, the vision, and you can come past that much. And uh, that's, that's, why, that's why I do what I do. <laughs> and that's why I'm in love with, with, with the field and the potential that it has. Right? So I thank you. I thank you for, for allowing me to, to share these reflections. And, and, and I hope we continue to converse openly. Uh, as I said, we all have to bring something into the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edgar, for really grounding us with those reflections. And as an ethnic studies student who really fell in love with ethnic studies, actually at CSM, I um, was kind of more on the fence prior to coming to community college um, at CSM. Like everything that you just said just affirmed why ethnic studies is so important. And maybe I'm a little bit biased, but in, in my opinion, one of the most important um, academic spaces exactly because of what you just said, it's not just an academic space, it didn't come from, you know, lofty folks in the ivory towers of academia, but it came from people like us, from the community. So really, thank you. Um, and then moving on to Rudy, I am very excited for your presentation as well, um, because as previously mentioned, Rudy was actually part of the CRP, and is the last, um, the last person at CSM 
who was part of that legacy and who carries that forward today. Um, and so I'm going to give your question um, to reflect on and answer throughout your speaking time is what was your experience like with the CRP? You, 
you, you were there with others uh, who were like-minded, who were also seeking, um, you know, uh, are we all seeking? <laughs> this is, this is the, the, the time, the best, this is why I like uh, community colleges, because you have these young minds that are still wondering, what, uh, what is my destiny? What am I going to do with this life? And sure enough, you know, this is uh, th this was um, this is the case. And, and sure enough, that, that was uh, it's a, it was a wonderful experience uh, to to fit right in and to be part of something very special. Um, I still have my my pin, uh, my CRP pin, and it says "Right On" on there. And it's always about power to the people. It's always about giving power to the people because you know that's how it, that's how it is. And, and I have a, a card. I mean, this is the real deal. You, you get a pin, you get a card. You know, you know, you sign up, and you're, you're part of the program. And, and it's uh, and it, it was exciting. It was not just a place to gather uh, to to work on your homework or to or to get tutored, but you know, you also have a social moment. You know, you have a very important uh, times when when we would have meetings and. And you know there would be things that would be uh, presented. You know, there's a, you know, if you're looking for a job, there's a, there's a job opening over here. There's, I mean, it was communal, absolutely communal. There was a, 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 a large Filipino club called the Samahan, and they they did all kinds of events uh, there at CRP, and then they did a um, a lechon, uh, it's a, a, a pig. You can't do that anymore. On campus, you can't uh, cook a, a, a pig on, on campus. Right? <laughs> Boy, it sure tasted good. <laughs> and and the, the the aspect of the they did they did the tiny cling, uh, which is with the these bamboo poles that you bang together and stuff. I not, I would never have known about the tiny cling if I hadn't you know been part of that and seeing that you know. And, uh, and I took an active role as, um, as a tutor and, uh, at, C at CRP. And one of my, uh, one of my, uh, there was, I had a, a man, uh, an older man, he was, uh, I'd say he was uh, in his mid-50s, uh, Senor Couchy from Peru. And I'm like, dude, you're old. <laughs> what are you doing here? In the whole sense of community college, and he, what is he, his, his um, needs were that he needed help with his English because his English was not up to par. And I would work with him on that. And, I'm, and the whole time, I'm like, this is an older man, this is a mentor, this is a, a, a elder, you know, who could teach me so much, but I, instead I'm, I'm returning the favor, you know, because he would share things with me. And I'm like, where would this happen? Wasn't in a place where you feel safe and you feel comfortable. We spoke the same language, you know, and uh, that was, that was one of the joys of, uh, of, of participating. That we had a um, a newsletter. It was called it was called the Grapevine, CRP News, and and right right in the first uh, page, there's an announcement. It says, you know, try to uh, it says please don't buy or eat iceberg lettuce. Because the farm workers were, were boycotting the the, 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 the you know the, the companies uh, because they would not come to the to the negotiating table and come up with a new contract. You know, and right up there, it was just try to and he, they said they take it one step further. Go inside the store, talk to the manager, and tell the manager that you are boycotting iceberg lettuce because you know so they can take it off the shelves. You know. This was activism, you know. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times, to go to phrase, you know. But it, it, it was, it, it was to us, it was natural. It was like this is how we do it, you know. And so there was these, uh, uh, um, um, th th these came out every week. Uh, there was articles uh, you could write. Um, in fact, I wrote one on, on, um, on the. Uh, there was a series called Kung Fu back in the 70s, early 70s, and uh, I wrote on, on the fact that the, the, the main protagonist wasn't Chinese, you know? You know? Uh, 
So um, uh, it's, it was, uh, so I, I get to explore, you know, that aspect of, of critical thinking, of writing, of expressing, and uh, uh, so there was, um, there was, there was that, you know, and, and we, we all look forward to, to reading the grapevine, you know, see our news. This is a, a brochure from, um, from the Times, and uh, uh, this is, um, and, 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 you know, this is the only one I've got, folks, I got that, and so I don't have any more, but, um, but you, you can see the camaraderie, you can see the solidarity, you know, I'll, I'll be willing, I'd love to, for you all, take a look if, uh, at some point, maybe later on, uh, and you can see how important it was to, to have um, uh, that, that connection with the community, and um, um, we had Bobby Seale, uh, for those that are not familiar with Bobby Seale, he was the co-founder of the Black Panther Party, and he came and he spoke to the college, number one, to the college, you know, and, and then he came and, and spent time with us over at Building 20 uh, at CRP, you know, where, where we could grill him, uh, you know, at, at our, he never complained about the questions that we were asking. We were asking some hardcore questions, you know. You know, what are you going to do with the, you know, what, what, I mean, just everything that we talked about, that was happening at that time, you know. What's your, what are your views on the war, what, all that kind of stuff, you know. But this is, and this is how big it was. Uh, I'm not in the picture because I was in class at the time, but I know when this picture was taken, and there's, you know, this is how big it was. Um, and so these are fond memories that I have. It was a time of, of solidarity. It was a time of communal uh, uh, get-togethers. Uh, oh, and we had some parties. Uh, uh, so it was uh, it was wonderful. You know, you meet uh, wonderful people, and and, and and it just encourages you. And if it wasn't for C CRP, I don't know where I would have gone. I don't know how well I would have fared in college. You know. But, but uh, I, I will always hold uh, CRP close to my heart, and um, and I'm it. This is it. This is uh, once I'm gone, there's no more. There, I don't. There's no more, nobody else on campus that was uh, that went through the, uh, the CRP. You know? And um, with that, I'd like to close. Thank you very much. Thank you all again. Um, and so what is the Multicultural Center at this point? 
we are a safe space on campus that seeks to um, create students um, and seeks to provide students with a safe space to create change in their own communities. And we do this in a number of ways, one by meeting students where they're at, where they may not have a political consciousness yet, right, where they're just here to be like, hey, I don't know how to navigate college, help me out. To the students <laughs> like Layla, <laughs> I'm just gonna put Layla on the spot a lot, who have been doing this work, who have been thinking about um, the work of racial justice in their own communities and want another space to get paid for their labor. We also um, are a space where students, our AB 540 undocumented students, our current and former foster youth, our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex students, and whoever falls under those, um, that umbrella, um, and English as a second language learners to have a safe space on campus. Um, and we provide advocacy for them, um, not only like as they're navigating the college system, but on a structural level, right? We are talking to presidents, VPs, um, through the district to create a coalition of advocates to support and hopefully one day in the next few years we'll have like actual staff direct, uh, directly for these student populations. So I'm um, super excited about the work that we've been able to do for the last few years. But how we got here I think is a really, really important way. I think I want to bring us back to the students that we tend to attract, um, which tend to be students who are like working and it's already um, working towards creating these spaces on their own campuses. Sorry, I'm a little bit like moved on from some of my notes here. Um, but we do tend to have a really organic conversations in our center. You like will find that students come to grab snacks and then you'll have them engaging in conversations about the prison industrial complex, about revolution, um, anti-blackness in um, Latinx communities, right? Toxic masculinity. And I think that's what's really exciting about the moment that we're in as a multicultural center now. Right, um, we move beyond the masculinist, a revolutionary like thought process of the 1960s that have become more inclusive and intersectional in our analysis of a revolution. Um, and so, this also brings me in the type of engagement that I think of both my colleagues have already talked about, where the space not only serves as a theoretical space, but also a space for students to enact that action, which is really, really exciting. And I'll highlight some of the projects they've done throughout the years. Um, but taking this quote from Jason Fededa, who also um, profiles the, the history of the college readiness program about how students like Aaron Manganiello, who was a student activist in the 1960s, created us, um, created and gave us a model that stressed action as much as, a, as much as theory, social engagement in conjunction with philosophical reflection as part of the work of world making. Um, so my next slide is, I think just to kind of sum up what both my colleagues have already talked about, we do have a CRP timeline from 1965 to 1969 that was about starting off as a social services program that provided tutors and then because of the students and the staff that came and attracted to that space became a more revolutionary thought space where students got to refunnel, where they had to, where they got to enact, go to the mission, recruit students to become the next set of tutors. And that was like a really exciting program of the 1960s. Rudy already talked about what happened after 1969, right? Where we still have that spirit, but I think it transitioned a little, um, especially as um, the CRP became EOPS and started to um, come get state mandates um, put into the program where we do get to like, we start to lose a revolutionary perspective to be quite honest, right? And so as these budget cuts transform, EOPS became a program that needed to meet certain requirements of the state. Um, and certain students were ineligible to be part of EOPS. So the multicultural center then became the space that serves students who still needed the support, but still, uh, but still, um, still needed the support, but still wanted um, a, a space for them. And it became more of a diverse counseling program with an African American and Black counselor, a Latinx counselor, and Asian American counselor. And that's where we trail off with having both these programs existing, right? So by the time that I came in, in spring 2016, we had cut the program so much that there was only one half-time um, counselor, um, Miss <laughs> Ms. Silvia Aguirre Alberto, who has been so inspirational in this work. Um, at that point, who was also a CRP um, counselor at the time. She was working half-time with us, half-time with the OPS, um, and we had a small direct services program that provided students with supplies um, and books similar to EOPS. Um, and then I came in, 
And we really came back to this space of wanting to shift the program from liberal social services to a more activist-oriented uh, program. Um, that was really inspired, and I think at the time I didn't realize that like it had a legacy too, which is really excited to like organically learn from colleagues like Rudy from Malathi to know about the history of the CRP and how we were naturally doing these similar, um, the similar um, consciousness raising and action in this space. Um, and so I think with that, I want to uh, talk about a particular group of students that came about in 2015 to 2016 that I think were very much um, inspired or forced to take action in 2016 with the uh, presidential election of Trump, unfortunately, that it was clear that our student populations that we had been serving were going to be under attack at that point. Um, and they're called the SMCCD Rise Up, which is a coalition of student activists across the district that work together to demand from the board to implement a set of demands similar to the CRP students of, 20, uh, of 1969 that were advocating for ethnic studies. However, their needs and services were different, right? We were at, those students were advocating for the expansion of dream centers, for the full implementation of the budget for these dream centers, um, for things like Wi-Fi, right? <laughs> like things that were very specific to their context, and they worked across the district. And I think we really like. I want to honor their labor um, for the ways that we um, we became a dream center as well, right? We were just a multicultural center, and that's why we're the multicultural dream center now. But their labor really expanded our us as a center. We were a small office next to EOPS, and then we grew to a much larger center. Um, but these students, I also want to focus on who these students were, right? There are students coming from uh, the learning communities, MANA, um, Project Change, right? But there are also students who on their own have already been active in uh, movements like um, the Black Lives Matter movements and the move towards against police brutality. They were in San Francisco protesting. They were also fighting against housing justice, right? The evictions that were happening in 2016 were so impactful that all these things coming together really um, spoke to their skills and created an organic coalition of students um, to be able to set those demands. So this is a really like a momentous, um, like I think during the time, this is also the first group of students who used the MCCDC as an organizing space that felt really important um, and organic. Um, the next set of students that after we got like the budget, we were able to expand, um, we started a scholar internship program. Um, and this group of students is hired on to create political education amongst the campus. And they do this in a number of ways. This particular year, um, after the pandemic, we were really happy to be back on campus. So part of their work was to actually look at archives similar to what Rudy has shared, right, about what the, the program has been throughout the years, but also visit the sites like Building 20, where they, that no longer exists, is a parking lot, right? They went to Building 1, where it was the first original CRP program, and they created this really cute reel. I won't play all of it. So I'll leave it at that. Follow us on Instagram and you can watch the floor reel. Um, <laughs> and all this to say is that our students have been trained with the idea that CRP has been fundamental to who we are now. Um, and in this process, they implement programs. So one of the first programs that came out of our scholar internship program was by Lanian, who was one of the SNCCD Rise Up student leaders who then became a scholar intern and started to be inspired by actually this, the, um, uh, Jason Pereira's article from College Readiness to College of Re from College Readiness to Ready for the Revolution, which talks about the CRP history in 1969. Um, and he, um, and then he actually invited Dr. Pereira to talk about the history of CRP. We also had a, a, a um, an activist panel that included Daniel, who had already done a lot of activist work in the community, but as well as Mary Evans, who had been a um, student, um, who had been a student at SS State because we actually couldn't get anyone from the 1960 like CSM uprisings um, to come speak, but she had been doing the similar work at SS State, and she spoke about our experience, and now currently, like. If I talk about her history, she became a physician and now takes classes at CSM again in ethnic studies. And so we're really grateful that we get to have these intergenerational conversations in ethnic studies and really momentous people.
people who come back to our ethnic studies program. So that was one of the first um, programs that like our scholar interns got to implement on their own. The other program that had to happen during the pandemic when students started to see like how do I create political education when we're remote, right? And one of them was the At The Root podcast that was created with three of our scholar interns um, who built the podcast from the ground up. They produce it, they edit it, they interview the speakers, they create the scripts. Um, and this one in particular, the one I'm highlighting, is on the college readiness program, but they've talked about um, um, deconstructing the like, good immigrant narrative, they talked about ethnic studies, they've also done um, a lot of the work around what it means to love and um, use love as a framework for justice. And so these like these political education right is not limited to our CSM community, we'd love to share them out to the larger community and hopefully they're accessible to everyone. Um, and so finally I want to like transition it over to Layla to talk about the Rising Revolution um, so the Rise Revolution Conference was CSM's first ever social justice conference um, that I had the great privilege of being able to co-lead along with uh, my fellow scholar intern, Brittany Art Haram. Um, so I started um, as a scholar intern in August 2021, um, and there was like a list of projects that you could um, volunteer to be part of the, the podcast. There was um, academic counseling for, for our peers, um, and there was a social justice conference. And this immediately caught my eye, and I was like, I, I want to sign up for this. Um, and long story short, that's what uh, Brittany and I got like to be doing. And besides from the initial idea of there being a social justice conference, um, Jackie and Paula really gave us full reign to just kind of put our own influence on it, um, and frame it and structure it in any way that we found to be important and meaningful to us personally, um, which I really appreciated. And so from August to the conference in April of 2022, this year, um, you know, we spent so many hours um, researching just what does it mean, like what does social justice mean, like what are the current, um, like the baseline kind of understandings about social justice, um, and organizing and like social movements and all these things um, to our peers at the time and what is the best way that we can expand and really foster that sense of political consciousness. Um, and so the, the legacy of the Culture Readiness Program and the Jason the article um, that Jackie mentioned were extremely um, fundamental in organizing the conference and really um, envisioning how we wanted this to come about. And my first introduction to the article was actually in uh, Dr. Mafi Aymar's class, Ethics Studies class. Um, and when I first read that, I, as I mentioned earlier, I was just like, I was stunned. And I, I went around to anyone who would listen, and I was like, did you know? Like, did you know that there was like the college readiness program at CSM in the 60s, and then it evolved into this radical, just like space that. Um, really intense things happened and there were protests and then people got fired and there was all these conflicts and everything. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so that was really important to me. And then a few months or many months later, um, coming into the process of the social justice conference and how we wanted to name it actually is where this like first kind of came to me. Um, Rick and I were researching different conferences around um, local um, college campuses that were really similar to sort of social justice um, events and we were like brainstorming what name we could do and then I, I came back to this article and I was like wait like from college readiness to ready for revolution um, it has such a deep meaning and connection to the FCDC and to directly to us as students of um, CSM involved in ethnic studies and we were like this is it this is what we want to do this is our purpose for this conference is to um, prepare people for the revolution because it's it's been here the revolution has been needed, um, it's been acted upon, and it's just as important to um, be mindful of this and be part of this, this movement and this, um, this desire and action to make change um, now as it has always been. And so that's what we set out to do. Um, we just, we brought in, it was a week long, and it was part of CSM's um, centennial or 100 year celebration. And so we were really blessed um, with the support of 
so many different people, um, David in the audience, um, many other folks, um, the other David from the Honors Project, Malti, Jackie, Paula, um, so many great folks, like administrative level, marketing level, everything. Um, and we were able to have a whole week dedicated to this conference. Um, it was hybrid format, there was a virtual component, there were in-person like watch parties. The last day was fully in-person, um, a big celebration with feasts and performances and art and music and everything. Um, and we really just wanted to invite um, different educators, activists, um, artists, people who use art and poetry to um, bring about social change. Uh, to educate not just our students, but we wanted to also make this a place of learning for um, our educators, our faculty, and to the, the broader San Mateo Bay Area community. I'm um, really open it up to an, an on and off campus thing. Um, and so we were able to have speakers such as Dr. Angela Davis come, which was insane. <laughs> um, still don't even know how I did that. Like, I, I don't believe that it really happened, but it did. Um, we also had amazing folks like Teresa San Antonio, um, Dr. Lenita Warjak, who was one of the, uh, who was the leader of the Native American student branch of the Third World Liberation Front um, that helped bring about ethnic studies actually at SF State and UC Berkeley um, back in the late 60s. Um, we had Stockton organizer Jasmine Del Fossi, um, Marshallese poet, educator, activist, um, Kathy General Kitchener, all these really brilliant um, community members come and educate us um, through theory, praxis, and then we engage in community dialogue on how we can take all these things that we're learning and actually employ them in our daily lives. Um, so yeah, it was a beautiful experience and I'm just grateful to have been part of it. I'm really excited to see what the next cohort of scholar students um, evolves into. Thank you, Layla. And I know Layla's a brilliant speaker, so if you want to hear more about like her her, her uh, facilitation and moderation, all the Rise and Revolution conference content is still online, so you can go and find it um, and hear about these really great dialogues that our students got to have with these like amazing and brilliant scholars and put those things into conversation. I, I think this is like the really special thing about that we get to do on the day to day. But I think in closing, before I invite you to next year's uh, Rise and Revolution Conference, I just want to name that, like all the work that we've done, yes, it's love, but it's also a lot of resistance and a lot of pain that students, faculty, and staff go through against administrators oftentimes. And so I don't want to say that, like, I don't want to romanticize this moment because I'm really proud of it, but it, it's been a lot of hard work. A lot of people who have had to leave, who had to, like, be fired, right? I want to regurgitate that this is really, has been a really, like, hard work is also a lot of suffering. And as much as, like, I, 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 I love the idea that, that we get to love and be a community with each other, none of this was done without a fight. And so with that, I just want to invite you all to our next Rise and Revolution conference for next year from April 20th uh, to April 22nd. And so that's the end of my um, session. I'll bring it back to Layla for some questions. Thank you so much, Jackie. And so with that, that concludes the first part of our event. Um, the panel discussion and presentations, and now we'll be moving into um, some Q&A, and then after we go through some pre-written um, questions, we can move into some, some audience questions should time allow. Okay, so first off, in Jason Freda's article that you mentioned um, from College Readiness to Break the Revolution, he highlights one outcome of the CRP as the fostering of community ties between various groups of color. He writes, quote, for the first time, black, Asian, and Latino students, previously isolated from one another in their respective neighborhoods, now came together, worked within a new social space, and discovered, in the process, their common experiences of poverty, racial discrimination, poor educational facilities, and police brutality. At an earlier point, these phenomena might have been interpreted simply through the lens of one's own historical or cultural experience. Yet, as students participated in the CRP and its fledgling ethnic studies courses, 
They begin to learn and link their histories together, end quote. You all have a background in ethnic studies. What are the potentials of ethnic studies for developing third world unity and radical consciousness? Do your own personal academic journeys and current classroom spaces reflect similar experiences of multicultural community building through academic spaces like the CRP and ethnic studies curriculum? Anyone? Big question. <laughs> it's a very big question, but I also think it's a, a question that invites us to reflect on on the on this key aspect of, of ethnic studies scholarship that I mentioned earlier in terms of coalition building. Um, it invites us to reflect deeper on it because there are aspects of it that still come through as unfinished work. And it asks us to continue to be reflective on the ways in which we continue um, to reproduce um, some of the ways uh, or some of those structures that continue to divide us. So while ethnic studies scholarship and the sense of liberation and revolution do call for a, a sort of a, 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 an understanding of those shared experiences and histories, we also need to be very critical and aware of the ways in which there's still a lot of work to do uh, within that scholarship. And so I think we're coming to realize the limitations, for example, of nationalistic approaches to, um, to envisioning a revolution. We're coming to realize the limitations within those nationalistic approaches of sexism and homophobia, or anti-blackness, or invisibilizing or uh, uh, indigenous struggles for uh, land and so on and so on and so forth, right? Really confronting the difficult, the difficult questions that although our histories are similar as people of color confronting the settler colonial state, they also invites us then to keep ourselves critical in the ways in which those histories might reproduce those same structures, right? And so, what does it mean from an indigenous point of view to think about settler colonialism uh, uh, in a way, right? What, what does it mean from a feminist point of view to think about community and so on and so forth? So, yes, I do not have answers for that. <laughs> but I do think that it is an invitation to continue to reflect in the ways in which we can continue to build on that vision of coalition building beyond uh, limited nationalistic or beyond limited tribalisms in a sense. Thank you so much for the answer and I think, I think the fact that you, there, you don't have an answer for it, a clear cut, you know, definable set of words for it, um, is exactly the beauty of it. You know, these things are things that we're um, deciding about, thinking about as a community and so in that nature it has to be fluid and constantly evolving um, based on what I believe you think of as a liberated future. So thank you for listening. Anyone else, Jackie? Yes, okay. Uh, so the last part. Um, what are the potentials of ethnic studies for developing third world unity and radical consciousness? Do your own personal academic journeys and current classroom spaces reflect similar experiences of multicultural community building? through academic spaces like the CRP and the ethics of these Yeah, I think on a more practical level, like I think what I see a lot in the MCCDC is like an organic like challenging of each other and our own perspectives. I think we use a lot of ethnic studies frameworks to um, articulate our thought processes and theories, but I think what's really exciting is when we get to like add um, more nuance, right? Like last year for the Rising Revolution Conference, we talked about fat studies, right? And I think integrating these other disciplines that we wouldn't particularly maybe think about as ethnic studies in conversation to what does liberation and justice look like in body sizes and in, um, in um, the other one is around like um, aesthetics and beauty, right? And really challenging those things. So I'm excited for what the potential it has to move us forward and think about the world making that we haven't even really considered up 
like beyond a couple years ago. So I'm I'm excited for the potential. Yeah. Um, also, the uh, the fact that you know the times change, and so tactics have to change as well. You can't use old tactics with new times. The struggle is real. It continues. You know, it's like, uh, okay, so what's the best approach? We need to find a more uh, homogenous uh, uh, approach, an approach where you, know, you, you can incorporate uh, other fact, fact, factors uh, that weren't considered in the past. I mean, you know, I mean, we have technology in our favor, uh, but it's, it can also be a double-edged sword. Um, you know, and, and I'm, um, I'm impressed with the, uh, the youth of today, you know, having access to, to, uh, to social media and, and connecting and, and in, in, in the workplace, you know, you know you, I can see the, the discussion boards, you know, and that you can do on, on, on campus and stuff. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is where it's going, you know, this is how, how we're going to have uh, um, uh, rap sessions. Because back in the day, rap sessions meant that we would get together and talk. Because there was no, no Wi-Fi, no internet, and and because of, of, of the nature of how it was back then, we actually would meet at, uh, at our at our elders, uh, uh, you know, the, the professors that we had, the, the counselors that we had, would open up their homes to uh, to us, and we would have rap sessions. We'll talk about what's going on in our lives, what's going on in the community, what's going on in the world. You know, um, and I got to see, to meet, uh, I got to see my professors, who I you know, call them my elders, um, um, uh, first hand, you know, to see how they interacted and, and, and stuff like that, informally, you know. And, and I, I, I try to keep that mentality alive, you know, with, uh, with, with, my, uh, with my classes, you know. I, I have what's called office hours, but I just say, anybody wants to hang out and talk, uh, let's do that. So yeah, with new tactics, we've we'll got to come up with new tactics at different times. Thank you all for your answers. Um, this next question is actually for you also, Rudy. Um, one of the main themes of the Rise of Revolution Conference was arts and its significance as a movement builder and vessel for liberatory thought and feeling. What role, if any, did you witness the arts playing within the college readiness program? Well, there's, uh, you know, the artistic uh, ability um, comes in different ways, you know, you, you can do it through poetry, you can do it through, uh, through drawings, you can do it through music, you know, all, all these components, and, and uh, the, you know, with the times come the struggle, of music reflects the struggle, in other words, so we would hear a lot of this uh, 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 poetry that would come out, and, and it was, um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Gil Scott Heron, who was the uh, godfather of what's called the uh, rap, you know. And back then, I mean, he would talk through it, it was like very powerful stuff, very revolutionary, you know. The, uh, the revolution will not be televised, it was one of those slogans, you know. And so that was all reflective of, of the times. And uh, you could see that, you know, in, in, in the drawings, they would make a beautiful, drawings depicting uh, uh, indigenous, uh, African-American, and, and uh, you know, a uh, very holistic approach, you know, as well as modernism, you know, viva la huelga, you know, uh, like, you know, viva la causa, you know, it's, it's the whole, such a, such a childless aspect was, was very uh, prominent, it was very prominent, you know, and, 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 and music, again, you know, was, was all part of that, that Category you know, the, the, of people coming together and, and, and expressing themselves. And you could hear, you could hear, it, you know, with the discussions that we would have, like our weekly discussions at, 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 at CRP. It's like, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? You know, we need to promote, we need to perpetuate you know, the, the revolution. Mm -hmm. And opening up to Jackie and Edgar. Um, do you have, do you have any comments on how art and creativity might influence your 
couple of years ago who um, came uh, to the MCCDC as a social media publicity um, intern. And what they did, they had a background in photography. They're just like, really talented in general. But for one of the projects that they did was around this time, like Halloween, around like um, um, culture is not a costume. And so they literally um, brought students from different learning communities take pictures of how they wanted to represent themselves, right? Um, and we use those as like the posters to promote the multicultural center. Um, and I think that it's really like bridging both like students, like brilliance around like these critical political issues around appropriation, but also like this art piece that people could use to really see themselves reflected on campus. And so I, um, in terms of like bringing those things together, I don't think they're like disconnected. I think the revolution and like the extent of all these things are coming together simultaneously. Yeah. <laughs> Very well. Right. Absolutely. Um, okay, I love that you had uh, the inextricable bond between art and religion. Um, okay, next question. Um, do you all feel that the history and legacy of the CRP is discussed enough? Why is it important to keep this knowledge alive and pass it down to future generations of young scholars? Uh, I can tell you from experience, every semester, every, in every class, I always talk about the legacy of, of, uh, of ethnic studies and, and, I, and I, I talk about look, history is here in this, in this college. You know, you know I, I talk about CRP, I talk about you know, what, I, what I was saying. And then I said, by the way, you know, now you have EOPS, which is a, a, you know, um, an offshoot unit, and it's just a, a transition. I said, in all the colleges in, 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 uh, in California that have EOPS are patterned after the one here. So there's history at CSF. And, 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 it, and it was because people stood up. People stood up and they spoke out, and they, they, they said, enough is enough. We're not going to take this anymore, and, the, and the, that's why you have the uprisings, you know. And uh, and, you, and the cities, because the administration has always been against us, you know. It's, it's still happening uh, as we speak, you know. And so, so you got you got to. I'm passing on the proverbial torch, and it was passed on to me, and I'm passing it on to you. When it's your time, you pass it on to others. Well, I, I think that if we take a moment to reflect on the direction of just higher education and academic spaces in general and the way in which they increasingly become more corporatized, that really helps us see also a, a, a disinterest in, in, in colleges, including our own, um, to talk about uh, uh, anything beyond um, honing academic skills for students who can then enter this corporate world, right? And so uh, uh, Jason Ferreira, for example, in his article uh, makes a really um, um, illustrative, uh, makes the case that CRP was different precisely because he was seeking to be something beyond this liberal social program, providing students with academic skills, but more of a reflective space in which critical thinking and transformative change could take place. And so sometimes I wonder how much either uh, in not having these discussions, how much do we in our academic spaces continue to invest in promoting academic services kind of spaces, creating students that will prepare them certainly for this corporatized uh, model of education and higher education. So that's, I think, a very important conversation to have and very important questions to raise. Uh, are we sort of returning to this more liberal social help kind of students? Or are we really holding those critical questions that can enable all the kinds of spaces, that can prepare all the kinds of students, that can enable all the kinds of conversations, right? So that that's the question to, uh, to, to, to be asked. And from what I see, as I said, we reflect on the direction of our education. Unfortunately, it seems that we do tend to have more, to side more on the liberal approach to the, rather than the critical, uh, uh, a revolutionary approach of, its, of the 1960s and that vision, right? But I don't know if that's just my perception. Yeah, or <laughs> yeah. I, I, I totally agree. I think, um, no, to answer your question, no, I don't think we talk about the history of therapy. 
as much, but I think in these last few years, as we've been exploring CSM's like 100 year anniversary, I think it's like really beautiful how folks, like even though it's already been discussed in certain classrooms, I think we're taking special attention to really raise the complex history of CSM as a whole, right? And honoring so much of the student labor um, that happened and so much so much sacrifices that happened to be able to get us where we are now where the MCCBC does get to exist and get to bring back some of those legacies within the parameters that we get. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I'm really just picking up on this underarching um, theme about the more we talk about this history, the more um, young folks can get inspired to um, really like carry that action forward and then to evolve it into their own different new manifestations of what a social justice radical um, change looks like for them. So thank you. Okay, moving on, um, Ferreira argues that, quotes, ironically, programs like the CRP that arose out of revolutionary movements and moments have been watered down in popular memory to stand for a series of liberal reforms directed at college curriculum, faculty hiring, and admission policies. Diversifying the institution, in other words, has replaced the notion of revolutionizing higher education and developing a praxis that would speed the transformation of the American social order." End quote. How do you all, as educators, work against this to ensure that the goal for activist work within academia remains focused on radical liberation and self-determination rather than just diversity? How can we all, as students, community members, administrators, etc., play our part in this? Um, I, I could say that um, one, one of the ways is by um, exposing the history. Uh, and um, it never fails. Um, I love this country. This is, a, this is a beautiful country and I'm a, I'm a proud citizen, but we have a very dark history. And when I share this with uh, my classes, my students walk away with uh, their mouths are open. They're like, I, I didn't know that. I will look it up. Look it up. Don't just take my word for it. But look it up, you know. See it for yourself. And with that, you need to understand why we have a struggle. Why there's inadequacy. Why is, uh, there's so many inequities uh, in society and, and, and stuff. You know? And this is how you do it. You understand the history and you fight uh, against the, the legacy of that, of that history. Thank you. Anyone else? You know, uh, teaching is a very reflective process for most of you who are educators. One is constantly reflecting in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And then asking my students, teaching a class in Asian American studies and learning about the history of Asian peoples and their relation to the United States asking my students about, and these are very young students and coming out of high school, and asking them whether raising questions about race and the process of racialization in this country are still relevant and important for them personally, and how do they see, how do they see that relevance and that importance? I say, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not important anymore. But when you come to the understanding that we do live in a highly racialized state, and that when people uh, have forced to wear their race on their face, in essence, and that that has direct impacts into their lives, then I think it's a question that might concern us to try to investigate how this comes about. And if we add to that element the, the idea that this racial state, this project, this ongoing project, that enables a, a, a racial state, that enables us a, 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 a project of of, of white supremacy also enables a project of destruction, of environmental destruction. So if you can't see the racial impacts in your life, you might be able to see the environmental impacts on your life and the life of all of our communities. Because it's the same project that continues to push for capital and greed and destruction. And it has just very intelligently maneuvered race and gender and sexuality as tools to operationalize it in a more effective way. But it's the same project. And so I, 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 I try to invite my students in that process of reflection in which they're able to see themselves and, their, and uh, sort of what's at stake for themselves. 
and, and, and investigation and in critical thinking, which is happening, I believe, less and less in a K-12 education system. So when they get to us, it's not only about opening this important conversation, it's about having a conversation about how we think about these things. And so, um, but uh, definitely, that's my approach. As I said, it's a, it's a constantly reflective process. Thank you, Victor. And so finally, you all have been doing this work for so long, and as Jackie was mentioning earlier, this work is this work is hard. It's meaningful. It's it's coming from, coming from a place of love, but it's also really challenging to be constantly um, reckoning with and being face to face with the ugliest parts of our society and our world. And so, how do you sustain yourselves in such a challenging line of work? How do you rest, self care, and ultimately what keeps you going? I think I have two answers. One that's very like a little bit superficial, and the other one was it's like the core of this work. Um, I think it's a lot of relationship building and building joy and celebration, like you've already mentioned, right? Like you can't do this without like the actual like community building, being in relation to people who sustain you when you can't do it. Um, me and my colleague Bella, who's not here, but we like tap in whenever she can't. Um, I come in whenever I can't, she comes in, and we know that we have each other's back. So for me, that's a really important part of building solidarity with folks, um, knowing when you show up and taking time for yourself to be able to not show up, right? The other part is that I, sometimes I come into the office and just yell. <laughs> like sometimes I'm just like, I've had enough, and then just release it and invite anyone who wants to join me to do some yelling and some crying. <laughs> It never gets tiring for me. Um, uh, it, it's it's um, every now and then I'll get an aha moment. You know, when I know that I've, I've reached somebody, I, you know, it's because of the, uh, the nature of the questions that they ask, or, or, or in my office hours, you know, where they want to want to ask further questions about what, what I was elaborating on. And, um, and so, it, you know, yeah, sure, so you miss a bunch. Uh, you, can't, you can't please everybody, you can't reach everybody. I get it, I get it, you know. Uh, but, you know, for those that you do, that, that moment is precious. And, and it's worth all the effort. And uh, that's when I, I can say, okay, it's, it's all good, it's all good. Thank you. Well, I, I, I already mentioned something to this nature earlier on when I said, you know, it's, it's, it's to keep that awareness of what it is that we're fighting for, right? And, it, and I agree with, with my colleague that it is in relationship. It is in relationship that we find that nurturing uh, for ourselves. It's in relationship with you all who are here that nurture our work. It is in relationship and, and in the ways in which, again, that which we fight for um, becomes that which we share with others. I think that's very, very important because nobody can guarantee us that within your lifetime you're going to change the world in these utopistic ways. That, that's not why we do what we do. We do what we do to, to transform and, and that transformation has to sort of start also in the relationships that you have. Uh, so something that uh, to keep always in mind right, is that uh, our elders have always advised us in that way. Um, how do you hold yourself in relationship? Uh, and, 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 and how do you cultivate that? And in that, you've won a great part of the movement, in a sense. Thank you so much. And so that concludes the pretty written part. Thank you all so much. Um, each and every one of you has contributed such crucial reflections, very profound and inspiring, especially for myself as um, someone who can follow in your guys' footsteps. And now I'll open it up. I think we could do a couple. Uh, one or two questions from the audience. to ask, um, at various times since 1968, at, at various times since 1968, people at uh, CSM, like Zelty Crawford, for example, have called for ethnic studies to be a graduation requirement. And that has been kicked around and, and uh, has never happened, although I understand you can take some ethnic studies classes to fulfill GE requirements. What are your thoughts? Um, Celtic Crawford is my mentor. Uh, uh, he's a friend. 
as a mentor, uh, he was my professor. Um, um, yeah, you know, the struggle he had to endure in the, in the uh, mid 70s and early 80s was, uh, was incredible that he was able to take on Goliath and, and win. You know? And so that struggle is, is, is real. And uh, it's imperative that we, uh, that we uh, uh, continue this uh, struggle. And, 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 and I totally agree that we should, that this study should be uh, part of the graduate program if you were going to get, uh, because it, it's never gone away. And people thought it was going to be a fad. It was going to be, in fact, a former employer of mine had told me, he said, you have a BA, this is before I went for my master's. He says, you have a BA in ethics studies, how long do you think that's going to last? You know, and I'm like, oh, man. Well, oh, needless to say, I didn't get the job, so. <laughs> but, but be that as it may, you know, that, that, was, uh, that was the consensus, is that, you know, um, you know it, it never went away. If anything, it's worth uh, uh, more valuable today Can I just add to that question? Um, I want to honor that there has been work in the last few years to actually um, uh, make um, the district get an ethnic studies graduation requirement. So I want to honor, like, I, I would pass this on to Malathi, who was like one of the core leaders in the advocacy um, in terms of like there's new um, Senate bills that were required for CSU to make ethnic studies a graduation requirement, and that like led to the organizing at CSM through the faculty that actually. Um, how long has it been? I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it is now a graduation requirement for students to um, be able to take an ethnic studies um, class for, to graduate. And if I could quickly add to that, I have nothing to say, but I do, that I want to invite us to, to keep in mind that ethnic studies as a field, as a, as a field of, as a space for scholarship, uh, is important in the way that it, in the way that it asks certain questions and the kinds of questions that it asks. So it doesn't matter what we call it. Not no, 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 stop to figure about the actual name of ethnic studies, yeah, exactly. right? The, the, and all of the problematics with that. It's not. It's to to emphasize the kind of scholarship that this field puts forth, uh, which is, and I might be biased, but it's not <laughs> found in any other um, scholarly body of work. It is a, it, the ethnic studies is able to ask and and and. and pushes to ask those difficult questions that we need to all be conversing, all of us, because it concerns us all. So. I'm the same generation as Edgar, so I wanted to say that when we um, either dropped out or finally got through college um, in the 70s, uh, we made a lot of progress as young parents with radical ideas of change. In, by, we, in those days, we just called it bilingual multicultural education. And people have forgotten, in the 70s, those Democrats actually funded the Department of Education set up four curriculum materials development centers. The API one was in Berkeley. So like we could order workbooks you know, and toys for our kids that were multicultural. So guess when they ended the funding? 1980, when Reagan got elected. So now we have this you know, pushback. But I would say what is available now is incredible compared to before 1970, right? There are so many multicultural books out there now, and videos, and programs for the kids, etc. So I just wanted to... Um, Credit CABE, California Association for Bilingual Education, because that's when the Spanish speaking Latino and the Asian Americans have in common the need for the uh, second, the English as a second language. I was an ESL teacher for the Vietnamese when they came. And so there has been relative progress, and I think we have to just keep coalitioning and keep pushing forward because when Lin Chi Wang at Berkeley had a raising dinner to get money because the ethnic studies budget always gets cut, um, on the panel in Poly Ballroom, it was the Latino professor from Sac State. 
He's the one that brought up the Chinese Exclusion Act. The other speakers didn't. <laughs> and so I think we just have to keep you know, up the coalition work and the K-12 ethnic studies. Didn't it just pass in Sacramento? And a mother at Berkeley High School told me her ninth grader is getting it. So thank you guys for what you do. Thank you all so much for participating today. Obviously, this is just a beginning of a discussion that needs to continue for much longer. Uh, I do want to mention for all of you that we do have two CSM exhibits up right now. In the rotunda is College of San Mateo, the photographs of Asago Tanaka, which will be on display in the rotunda until November 15th. And then opening today, the College of San Mateo, 100 Years of Making Dreams Come Through, which will be on exhibit through the end of August. So I invite you to explore both of those. If you wish to sign up for um, our email list to get informed of all of our upcoming activities, there are forms right here in the front of the room. Thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you again here at the district.